excellent. You look How are gorge. you? You look gorgeous. Look at, gosh, we have the best makeup artists. Yeah, do you the like best. our makeup? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, we have a, a wonderful guest, Larry Logan. Uh huh. Super excited. Um, so, Larry Logan was a contributing photographer from 1977 to 1984 for the magazine, and then vice president, creative director in the entertainment group of PEI from 1984 to 1994. And that, and that wasn't that wasn't exactly your plan, I imagine. I, I feel like maybe you transitioned from one thing to the next. How did that? How did that come about? How did you? Oh, during the Playboy years. Yes, during the Playboy years. It, sure. In fact, let's just start from the top. Yeah, let's with start your, from the beginning. With your whole start with Playboy, how did you end up in the Playboy family? <laughs> there you go. Uh, it really goes to when I was in uh, at university and and two different schools. I was doing off campus assignments for a number of professional magazines. And at that point, it actually got about 500 magazine credits. So when I was in Santa Barbara finishing up on my uh, second degree at Brooks Institute, Carrie Morris, who was the studio manager at Playboy Studio West, was aware of my work. He was ahead of me in school. And when I got out of school, uh, shortly thereafter, he said, why don't you come on board? You know, and uh, had an interview. It was interesting. I think my photojournalistic background was probably helpful mm -hmm. uh, because uh with Hef, you know, and sort of being ultimately sort of being his per, uh, personal photographer, uh, then you sort of have to have that background. Most of the other photographers were more studio uh, trained, as you two ladies uh, well know. Right. And so it was more of, you know, kind of how do you be a fly on the wall and have those journalistic, uh, you know, background. And so that, that's how I really got started uh, with the company. And then over some number of years, as the entertainment group developed, there was another part of my background, which really had to do with also in marketing and in design. And as the entertainment group started to come together, uh, I really sort of transitioned sort of in a consultant uh, role to the entertainment group and would look at the, the artwork and the programming and would have a point of view, uh, which the company appreciated. And so at that point, then I took on the role of vice president creative director. And, and did that for the next uh, 10 years, reporting uh, reporting to Hef. That's wow. awesome. T tell us what, that's that's very cool to come out of Brooks. And, and actually, you're the second one. Uh, Arne Freytag was on the show yesterday, and he also yes. came right out of Brooks and right into Playboys. So that that obviously speaks uh, for itself that Brooks Institute is phenomenal. Yes. Um, <laughs> but to go right into being Hef's um, personal photographer, I mean, what, what was that like? Was Were you excited? Were you nervous? <laughs> And how, how uh, did you get that yeah. position yeah. exactly? That So I, it was anticipated when I came on board. Uh, for the first little bit of time, I assisted the other photographers. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I had known Arnie. I assisted Philip Dixon, uh, a few of the other Pompeo, a few of the other photographers to kind of learn and get comfortable around nudity, mm -hmm. uh, but also in terms of just you know the way the system worked in terms of the photographic assignments. And then uh, what was coming up one night, Hef was going to be at the Playboy Club. And then uh, Don Rogers, who was uh, head of PR on the West Coast, just said, OK, it's time. Uh, so come tonight, you know, photograph Hef. And then uh, I did. And again, covered him as a photojournalist would. And uh, the next day, I got a call from Don. He said, well, for better or worse, uh, you're it. And so wow. uh, there's something about Hef had made a comment that I think he felt comfortable with my my approach. And he was really interesting all that time, you know, very much uh, was aware in terms of when he was being photographed and the photographer and, and kind of kind of that relationship. So at the very beginning, I think we just kind of clicked in that way. Yes, we heard the story how mm -hmm. he was how you were taking photos and he even remembered six, six months, months later yeah. how <laughs> many frames were yeah. shot. That <laughs> One's is missing. <laughs> mind blowing. But that was Hef. That was his attention to detail. That was his photographic memory. It was just one of the many mm -hmm. attributes that he had that made him such a phenomenal human being and made the brand yeah. so, I mean, what it the was. magazine, what it was and, and, and Playboy. <laughs> Uh, what, what, if you'd like, I mean, I, I could share two stories on, on his memory. I, I mean, would one love of them, it. definitely. But uh, one second, and, and we just because we can edit this. Um, watch your hand when you're uh, hitting the desk because it's really loud in our audio. I wish he could hear us yeah. right now, well, so he, he knows can to hear edit it. it. So he'll edit it out. But edit anyway. this out. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. So go ahead. 
Well, an example, uh, one of two examples of his incredible memory was that we we were off to uh, uh, for the Playboy Jazz Festival, mm-hmm. and, and it was a large group on the bus. Uh, we we came back on the bus, all of his friends and, and celebrities. We come off the bus, we walk into the mansion. Hef turns to his right, and Sandra Theodore's little dog was there. Hef goes over, he goes down on one knee, starts to pet the dog on the top of the head. I forgot the name of the dog. <laughs> And and so that's fine. I, I, I'm shooting a couple of different frames. It was a nice a nice moment. So got a couple of shots. Months later, Hef calls me and he says, "Larry, we're missing a shot." I said, "Okay." I and he says, it. "When I started to reach down to pet the dog on the head, and I started <laughs> to lean forward, and there was one flash that went off at that point, and I'm not seeing that photograph." Wow, it turns he out, said it, it like turns that out, detailed? Wow. That detailed. And it, 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 if you're a photojournalist, often you will remember that. And ah. when I edited the film and I said, Hef, your eyes were closed. So I pulled the piece of film out. <laughs> you bleeped. Uh, you didn't see that slide, <laughs> yeah. deleted it. And and he said, okay, in the future though, if you would leave all the outtakes, because again, somewhere he might've remembered there was a photograph. That is, that's amazing that he's like, in the very beginning, I went down and there was a flash. I like he know. knew exactly yeah. the moment. I mean, he knew like there was five frames that's, and frame I'm, number four is missing. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. wow. Uh, I'll give you the other example was uh, also by my training was really also an architectural photographer. So mm-hmm. I had assisted Julia Shulman, who's the world's greatest architectural photographer. I was doing that even while I was in school. And so at one point for Hef, I said, you know, why don't I photograph the mansion in architectural digest style, yeah. which I had been trained to do. And so I did that. And then uh, and it worked fine, you know, worked for some number of days and nights photographing. It was time to photograph his room or his suite, let's say. And so, you know, on two different levels there, mm-hmm. uh, sort of living quarters on mm-hmm. one level mm-hmm. and above that, a work area for mm-hmm. him. Before I could do that, one, I had to wait till he would be out of town on a trip that maybe it was okay, I won't go on that trip. To stage the photography, though, the butlers had to go in and photograph every square inch with Polaroid cameras. (gasps) And so if there was a stack of videotapes, if there was a pad and there were four pencils that were uh, aligned a certain way. They better be there. Every square inch had to be photographed. Mm -hmm. And then I would go in for two full days did all the coverage would leave and they would have to go back and mm-hmm. with, with the Polaroids put every single thing down exactly skewed exactly how it was stacked because his photographic memory was such that he would walk into the room. And if there was something off, something that was slightly Just turned slightly. that he remembered that was the stack of videos. That was the way the papers were. That was this over here that it would, you know, it would sort of throw him. Off. I mean, yeah. because he yeah. had it so well, mapped even though it was constantly changing That's and dynamic really interesting i love that thank you for sharing that that the butlers had to go in and photograph like that's, that's wild fascinating mm-hmm. Fascinating. Another interesting, very. That's an interesting thing. I had no idea. Yeah. Uh-uh. It was like, well, the butlers were telling us too. So we we had asked them, did you ever? You, there was three of them at one time that came in, um, and we asked them, did you ever like get in trouble for Huff? And they all said, oh yeah. And so, but Brian Olea was one, and he had just started, and he, you know, was in Huff's room, and and he was like, God, right? He these pillows he has are so thin and worn out. Like he, he has tons of money. He needs new pillows. So he went and got new pillows. And uh, uh, and Mary like called him up and she's like, no. you better have Not those good. old pillows. <laughs> Be, yeah, those were his Don't ever, yeah. ever, ever like mess with what he has and his yes. setup, <laughs> his system. His yep. system. It, it, it was a challenge for him. I mean, at different times, you know, sure. candidly, it would be, we, you know, it would probably be good to refresh uh, the mansion. And if you think about, you know, the large, as you know, the large parties and the number of people, it very much of it was a public yeah. house in, yeah. in so many ways. And therefore, there's going to be over time, you know, sort of abuse to the furniture. It's going to get worn a certain tear. extent. So that's, but, but that's for him, why. Because I always wondered why was something never, ever updated in there? The carpets were so worn out and the med table. And that's why. It, but the it, towels it, were it, the it, same. It was constant. I mean, yeah. every single day. But, but wow. for Hef, it was also... It was really sort of change. I mean, in some ways he could accept change, but in so many other ways, it was he really yeah. his comfort yeah. level. Yeah. That's where everything is. Yep. Uh, you know, please don't change. Right down that. to the colors and, that, and everything. Wow. And it's it's really what made so many things work that that side of him. Mm-hmm. But then that, you know, could that's yeah. a difficult thing 
to deal with. Well, well, like Bill Farley told us earlier, you know, as brilliant and, and genius of a man as he was, there was things that, you know, he wasn't very keen on and, and couldn't relate to, yes. such as taxes being taken out of a check yes. for a commercial he did for <laughs> Carl Jr. It was like, well, where's the rest of the money? That's and so uh, Bill was like, well, this is what happens every two weeks. We get our checks. We and he goes, like, well, how can the government I take know. that out of your check? It was so funny. <laughs> <laughs> there, there was actually it was interesting you're, you're so right i mean a lot of the day-to-day -day things that that we do uh but there was one interesting thing where he sort of connected to his past he had this this beautiful mercedes uh i think it was a 300 series convertible that mm -hmm. uh, you know from the 50s uh that he had when he first made it big and it was stored outside of the mansion uh and at some point he said, you know, I, I think I'll, I'll sell it because it's been in storage for so long. Uh, I think Rob Report in the various magazines said, you know, it was going to be worth a small fortune. Sure. And so I spoke with Mary and for the magazines to sell it. I said, OK, I'll take some photographs. So we had it there in front of the fountain at the mansion uh, in the circle there. And I said to Mary, you know, why don't you ask the boss to come down? I'll take some photographs, old time sake, yeah. getting behind the wheel. Hef comes down. Uh, and so you know, have, you know, behind the wheel, he gets behind the wheel and then he reaches down and he starts the car up. Now that wasn't intended. I mean, I had a couple of photographs of him yeah. looking over his shoulder and, you know, a nice That's, shot. Yeah. He starts it up, puts it in gear, puts it in gear, starts to drive in around yes, and around in the, the fountain circle. in the circle. So then cute. he goes underneath, as you know, underneath the archway toward the back. Right. Security is jumping, open the gate. Uh, yeah. And yeah. now they're also open scrambling. The get the like chase cars. Get the chase cars. So, oh, so who, knows, awesome. who knows where he's going? Yeah. So he's gone for, you know, I'm kind of standing there going, well, I'm not going to jump in the chase car. Yeah. Let's, let's see what happens. Yes. So a little bit later, a couple of minutes later, I hear the sound coming back up from the back gate, awesome. comes into the circle, yeah. circles it once or twice, turns it off, gets out, slams the door, looks at me, and he said, still drives like a truck. Hilarious. From there, love. From, from there and, and the great part of the story is he goes upstairs, uh, calls down to Mary and says, I don't want to sell it. Oh, I and love it. And so I it. had to take the the sort of the self-blame that I cost him a half a million dollars <laughs> in getting excited about the uh, about the but car. But how cool. He got Aww. so inspired, hopped in that thing and started it right up. It was sentimental. He was very, there's the sentimentality. Mm -hmm. that He had that. Mm -hmm. He was sentimental. Yes. That was... <laughs> That was part of him. Wait a minute. And uh, that's so cute. That's the uh, the, uh, the um, security. Open the gate. Open the gate. I know. The Everybody's cars. like, oh, my oh, gosh. Yeah. Hef he's is driving. The property. He's driving, you know. That's that wonderful. So... Thank you for sharing yes, that. Yes. It's probably the first and only time he got behind the wheel in many, many years. Oh, right? can you imagine? Everyone True. drove him Absolutely. everywhere. If you if you think about it, yeah. I'll, I'll, we'll have to share that story because we were at, um, uh, Stephen Randall was going to come on, but unfortunately he was not able to. And he had a hysterical story about Hef hopping in the front um, the front seat of his Prius. Oh, my gosh. And in his pajamas <laughs> with his. Yeah. So they had had a meeting, right? A big uh, editorial meeting. And it was him and Tom St Stephen Randall, Tom Stabler, uh, Gary Cole, uh, a couple other people from Chicago and Huff, and it was this extended, you know, and he had his storyboards out and putting everything together and whatnot. And so uh, the meeting was over and the guys were like, but we're going to just walk back to the Playmate house, you know, just down the street. So uh, Stephen Randall um, had his car there and he's like, OK, well, I'll drive over there. And so Hef comes out and he's like, Stephen, where's Tom? There's a couple more things I want to discuss with the boards. And uh, Stephen says, well, I'm going over to the house. And Hef goes, OK, and gets in the gets front in the seat front with seat him with, with the sure. boards in his pajamas. And and Stephen's like, all he could hear is Mary going, what, what do you think? He's your little best friend. You can't take him <laughs> off the property. <laughs> and he took him off the property and when went he over to the house. house and and then he called him and like have on the way <laughs> just so you know and it was totally fine sure. and then um him and tom stapler walked back to the mansion can you imagine and he's in his pajamas walking down charing so cross cute. with his storyboards hysterical I love it. <laughs> such a great story <laughs> do you remember the first time you met hef uh it was that evening uh but but it was interesting thing in terms of fate in one way wait that uh, the evening of uh of the... it, it, it was at the at the at the at the uh, Playboy Club, but oh, and this okay. was ni 1977. Right. But 
my wife and I, uh, interesting fate kind of thing, went on our honeymoon to the Playboy Club in Jamaica. This was back when they had the resorts. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it was 1970. And while we were there, uh, we paid the bellman or something five bucks to take us up to half suite. Yeah. And we went up there and it was sort of in a sort of a rooftop. You sort of had to enter it separately, a rooftop thing. And in the shower, there were crates of the small Pepsi bottles piled up. And it was like, That's cool. what are those for? And it would be, well, you never know when it'll come back. Mm -hmm. It's like, how many times has he mm -hmm. been here? Once, mm -hmm. you know, and, and wow. kind of like for the ribbon cutting. Mm -hmm. And so we, we had a sort of tour that never realizing that some you would couple of up. years later, I would be five feet away from F, yeah. you know, yeah. on, on a constant ongoing uh, basis. And, and it was and just kind you, of a funny. It, and you, and, re and you yeah. realize he loved Pepsi. He only drank Pepsi. <laughs> I did, my yes. Playmate of the Year shoot was in Jamaica. And it I was? and this ah. is the first time hearing that there was even a yeah, I didn't know either. A Playboy Club in Jamaica. Resorts. Playboy or resorts. Resorts. Yeah. Yeah. Resort. resort. I, mean, I mean, the company at Lake Geneva, uh, yeah. there was also in Wisconsin, there was one in New Jersey and one. Uh, that was there in Jamaica. And these were very, we were with some people the other night and they kind of said, wow, it must've been really wild and provocative, you know, <laughs> kind of like a sandals or something. It's like, no, I mean, no. it was really their, their Class. target was really an older audience yeah. even. and beautiful golf resorts, you know, sort of nightclubs that were built into the resort. So it was quite different, I think, than the, than the impression that people would have Is, had. Isn't it funny? We were talking about that earlier, how yep. people get that impression uh, with Across Playboy, the board. which it, it's fascinating. The more we speak to different, you know, the the different prolific people, really, mm -hmm. like yourself, mm -hmm. that are behind what I keep calling, which is true. It's it's a living, breathing brand yep. of incredible human beings. But he had class, mm -hmm. just really classy. And people don't, everything, yeah, and they, they don't know. They that. have a different idea. And when you say Playboy, they just it's always. It, their mind goes to smut, and I don't know why. <laughs> just I'm, like this that I just got. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it and it was never pornography. It yeah. was it was art. And then I'm sure there were the times of debauchery and his privacy or whatever. Absolutely. I don't privacy. none of my Our business. Private, his private life. But at, at the end of the day, I think he really. We've talked about this before. He was so pro First Amendment rights. He was so pro objectivity. Mm -hmm. He was so pro privacy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it and and that made it kind of. He was a very interesting. Mm -hmm. It's above and probably in our. I know my lifetime, but in generations forever. of American yeah, history, forever. one of the most intriguing human beings mm -hmm. with some of the most in, in influential people mm -hmm. in history mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that have been a part of Playboy in one way or another, and not even recognizing that the influence that he had on them. Yeah. Some people that have gotten their start in all kinds. Of, because we of had that. Mickey Gilly on, on yesterday. Larry, uh, Mickey oh, Gilly, Playboy record label. and he attributed yeah. his success, and yep. here's an icon himself mm -hmm. in country music, attributed his success to getting his very first record. Nobody else would give him a deal. 17 years. Playboy he was records, yeah. and, and Echo and I had no idea. Yeah. You know, we've been watching the, the Hugh M. Hefner. The story on Prime. Yeah, yeah on, on Prime. <laughs> but at the end of the day, I... It wasn't until then that I had heard mention of it, yeah. and then to be able to, you know, to talk. hear him say, and and he said, "What a, he was just a gracious man." He said, yes. "I just really enjoyed meeting him, and I'm just so thankful yes. for him." And I, that I wish I could remember. Go ahead, Corinne. I'm sorry. Oh no, no, no you go ahead, Larry. Just well, I, I was, was trying try to remember the name of the of the documentary. So a lot of people don't realize that Hef was a real key underwriter of now the feminist movement. Oh yeah, was really. Absolutely. I mean, you know, he was writing checks and, and supporting this. There's a great documentary. Again, I can't remember the name of it, but it really goes through all the things that he was doing in terms of you know Sammy Davis. Junior on yep. his TV yep. show, you know, yep. among sort of you know, like the how very controversial first it was Americans that he was and, there with him. Yeah. He knew and, what and, was it, wrong yeah. and look empowered at, people that yeah. Yeah. had every. If you look at all these different things, basically, sort of a you know, a, very much in terms of rights and, and a yep. crusader. And no matter where you are in terms of all, I'll say conservative versus liberal, you have to sort of look at the mm -hmm. you know the things that he really accomplished that are that are quite 
sort of separate, you know, yeah. in many ways, yeah. if you think about in terms of a pictorial uh, in the magazine, but he was very much of a pioneer uh, in that respect and, and accomplished, you know, some pretty extraordinary uh, things. I always get goosebumps. I know, just, me too. Just like nonstop. <laughs> with, with, when you look at, it was not Playboy After Dark. It was the penthouse Playboy. Pen, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. Black Wait, and white. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, what was the official name of that show? Because Play, Playboy After Dark was our, was the bizarre like yeah i shouldn't think it was playboy penthouse or what you know i'm trying I think it was blank. playboy what, what penthouse was i think so, it was, it was playboy so, penthouse. and which is yeah. probably why larry flint even called his magazine when he oh, became penthouse. the rival oh i oh I my god guarantee he just stole ding, 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 it from we just figure something out <laughs> <laughs> because there are a lot of imitators oh, yes yeah. <laughs> and no and none of them and 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 there are things that i learned in that documentary as well that uh, just artistically, every magazine followed suit. Absolutely, because the bar was so it was high set with so art high. and mm -hmm. imagery and and writing those beautiful and lines. presentation and and then the beautiful women that would just fall out into that trifold, yeah. <laughs> the gatefold. Oh yeah, the gatefold. We forgot it was called that. And uh, Arnie and uh, uh, yes. David Meese were calling that. I was like, oh yeah, the gatefold. And you and your wife are still. So you've you were married did your honey had your honeymoon in <laughs> jamaica at the the playboy resort mm -hmm. ended up at playboy two years later and mm -hmm. and you're still with your same wife i'm still with my same wife uh, she's here right <laughs> next to me so how, is, how many years you know, have you been married 50 that's... wonderful years oh my uh, god as of this year. so there that's you go. amazing that's beautiful Thank you. i love, I love to love hear it, that love it, love yes it. Amen but to that. I have to say something about, I mean, Lily, see, at the very earliest days, I mean, you could naturally, it could be threatening for a young wife in terms of what of does course, your husband yeah, do? Of course. He's a photographer for Playboy. And and Lily was able to come on some of the uh, shoots where there, there was a comfort level. And she realized pretty quick in terms of the professionalism. Right. As you all know, right. you two ladies will know. I mean, very much, a, very much of a professionally run. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, a big production. Shoot yeah. In, <laughs> in, in so many ways. And when I give, various talks. Uh, and in fact, that I, I give a presentation that's called My Boss Wears Pajamas to Work. Oh, I And then I, I love talk that. about, I love talk that. about my, my career and, and Lily's often been in the audience. And so many people turn to her, women turn to her, would ask her, okay, what did you think of all this? And, and Lily has an answer that's kind of right out of an uh, answer that Hef often had, which is, you know, it's kind of a Rorschach test. Mm. You're sort of asking mm. me, Really, sort of asking yourself and your own comfort yep, level. That is very and your true. Own husband, mm -hmm. what would be your comfort mm -hmm. level? Mm -hmm. And she said, from my point of view, I understood what he did. I, yeah. <laughs> I know, know him very well. Uh, very happily, happily married. Right. And and the other thing was, I think my role as as the creative director was also a little bit different uh, sure. in terms of the responsibility because I kind of felt like Uncle Larry. Yeah. Because when you think about the the conferences and taking. I would take 25 or 40 playmates to Vegas, yep. you know, for some of the, the video shows and things and like so this. Yep, yep. And and like my responsibility is, you know, the show must go on and, uh, you know, we're going to put on a big Business. event and uh, <laughs> yeah, there's yeah, got to yeah. be a trust factor exactly. that I that I have with all of you mm -hmm. to be able to, you know, to be comfortable with me and, and to, you know, for, for us to do the job well. Right. And I think also with my relationship with Hef, I mean, it just, you know. No, that's uh, out of the question. You know what, of, what? She's right here, and I, I love her so dearly. Uh, Lillian, so. Hi, hi, Lillian. Hi, Lillian. <laughs> we want to yeah, see her. Hi. I'm on earbuds, so she won't be Tell able to hear me. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> Tell her to wave at us. Um, and you know that you're speaking to a point actually that keeps coming up, and and um, the comfort level, and certainly Corinne and I always talk about it is how comfortable and safe we felt at the, the mansion. The always the safest I've ever felt. Yep. In fact, and I felt like. Um, the presence of true gentlemen, absolutely, including Hef, mm -hmm. but Larry, all absolutely. of these men all of that you. were all of us, yeah, were of... absolute consummate professionals, mm -hmm. and and I tr I tell people that I I all the time it, that, I, that it is that's all, that I was, all it was almost spoiled and doing all of those promotions and being so protected and. Uh, that when I went into the real world, because we all know you were disappointed, Playboy, you know, <laughs> yeah, yes, I'm world. like, my gosh, 
<laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. This is horrible. I remember working <laughs> totally. for a photographer. I won't say who. Yeah. I won't. Yeah, but I worked for a photographer after I had posed for Playboy. And it was and I was not going to. I w- that's the only nudity I was ever going to do. Done. Yeah, exactly. Bam. Exactly, you know, let's exactly. throw that one True. away. I've done it. And and no one else. I would never do uh, any nudity for anyone else. That said, I did a shoot and he was trying to get me, you know, he's like, you did Because Playboy. they right away expect that. You know, and, and he was the one that kept saying, you know, mm-hmm. we not to sound vulgar, Larry, but we were talking earlier. Uh, Lacey's here with us and she, mm-hmm. you know, our bunny mom, but yes. we don't like yes. when people say titties <laughs> i don't like it yeah yesterday i, I said yeah. it twice and, and i don't and know why like, i just feel like it's just it, and that's a personal preference but i just i never had anyone speak vulgar or Mm-mm. it was all class mm-hmm. and it really was art and it was and it was just the next level i mean we were even talking about so we had our makeup done by um makeup art uh playboy makeup artist and after doing our centerfolds and then going on and doing working in the modeling world or the acting world, et cetera, I was always so damn disappointed when somebody do my makeup. I was like, no, you're yeah, not we were doing it right. We you're, you're not spoiled. doing the lips right. Yes, yeah, I don't look pretty. You look in the mirror, you're like, you're I'm making not- my lips look small. I can feel you got to make them bigger. <laughs> it was so, you know, we were- but, but those are, you know, on every level, on every I level, think, I think it's the same from, you know, the artistic. Yeah. End of it. Anyone that worked with Hef. The editorial side to it, the yeah. the bar yep. was raised. Yep. And then going anywhere else, it was probably a cake cakewalk. Like we were talking to Michael Lee and he went mm-hmm. on to have a wonderful career afterward, but wouldn't have gained the knowledge and everything, Certainly all of the expertise not. that he had. Certainly not. Had he not worked directly with Hugh Hefner. Right, right. <laughs> and and that's what we can all speak to, yes. you know, for any of us, anything that we're doing today, and certainly, you know, yourself, Larry, you know, you're, even it's when such you put a byproduct it, of you being at Playboy. Yes, and even know? when you put it behind you, because yeah. we all move on, we have our lives, mm-hmm. I, I think now it's fun to recollect and say, wow. And, and for us to also- I was a part of that. Yeah, and also to really have that appreciation and go, oh, wow, actually, I am the person I am today. I am doing these things. I'm doing all of this because of Playboy. And because I, I, I learned how to, you know, I, be, I became obsessed with photography. I became obsessed with all things skin. I, I was a skin care licensed yes. esthetician. Um, I became obsessed with marketing. I taught myself how to build websites. I was like the second, you know, playmate to do that. Um, I I write now. I mean, social all of this. etiquette. Yes, yeah, travel etiquette. etiquette. Everything. It goes on and on. And I didn't really have that foresight until just recently in my late forties. And I think we all it, there's something unique about uh, something that's so profound and big, mm-hmm. and it is big, and it's so it's the third largest brand in the history that we know of really it's the most recognizable and Disney, like Disneyland and Playboy <laughs> but how he said fate mm-hmm. earlier i loved how you said that it was fate it it's it's like you were being prepared for it because a lot of us can have a preconceived notion i know i did of course before i became a playmate i was offended because i had that same idea and i was offended by my boyfriend at the time who said I think you should be a playmate. And I didn't know what a playmate was. I just thought, no way. I When he told me it's, it's you know, Playboy, mm-hmm. I called my mom, Little Miss Self-Righteous. Dean thinks I should do Playboy. Can you believe it, Mom? That's awful. You know, I'm, I was 18, turned 19. But I have a similar story where I remember finding Playboys of course. The neighbor boys up the road had hidden them, and I put them in the basket of my bike, and I stuck them in there and rode to this little side street, and there was a, a hidden area with the light posts that I could sit in, and I sat there so no one could see me, and I remember pulling the centerfolds open. out, and to me, it was the it most was beautiful. beautiful pictures I had ever mm-hmm. seen, and I didn't think of it as looking dirty. looking at it. You're like, wow. And I was probably 10. Mm-hmm. And then a boy up the street, which is bizarre looking back, he goes, Karina, when you get older, you're going to be. And I didn't know what <gasps> no that way. I didn't know what that meant. Right. He did this with his hands. That's you know? cool. And I remember being upset about that yeah. and going home and saying, mom, what does this mean? The boy said, I'm going to be like this. And she laughed. 
And then my mother, <laughs> who never <laughs> swore that. from from the South, never said a cuss word. She says to me, when we're at the grocery store, she looks over at me because she always secretly wanted to do Playboy. She admired you the didn't art. You did tell me that. I know. What I don't. I just am so thinking cool. of this about fate. I love that. And my, my mom said, Karina. And I was about not much older than that. And not older. I was maybe 11. I don't know how old I was. And she goes, Karina, would you would you ever do Playboy? And then I'm like, because now I knew what it was, and I thought she was testing me that I had snuck and looked mm-hmm. at those pictures. And you said no. And so I felt guilty. I go, no, Mom, no, I would never, because I thought she was watching me. You know how moms do. And and then she goes, well, you should never be ashamed of your body. You have yeah. a beautiful body, and yeah. that's the only magazine. I'll never forget her saying this, because oh. I thought it was weird until I got older. And then I recalled that memory. That's so Because it was profound yeah. as at that age for my mom to say, don't be ashamed of your body. Yeah. It's art. Yeah. And, ma- and the only magazine, Playboy is art. That is so interesting. <laughs> that, and thank you for sharing that, because my mother, um, I was discovered by Greg Gorman in a restaurant in Santa mm-hmm. Fe. I was 18 years old, two months out of high school, and I was moving to Austin and uh, he was he always did these workshops in um, Santa Fe in the summer and he saw me and I was there with my mother and my high school sweetheart and he um, he invited us over to the table and he said I'm so and so and I'm shooting a German playboy and I want your daughter to come and test and I was like nope absolutely nope nope no way and my mom's like you are doing this I'm driving your ass there tomorrow and you're doing it so both of our mothers are yeah because that's what my mom said when I called her upset when Dean said you should do playboy she goes Karina this is a perfect opportunity for you you don't pass that up but it's one of those things where it was set yeah. Uh, it was almost like I yeah. I needed to go through all of those things. Otherwise, I would you not. Would, yeah, I would have exactly. I wouldn't have been prepared. Yeah, exactly. I'd have been like, "No, are exactly. you insane?" Yeah. You know. And I was so modest. We were talking about. I used to cover oh, uh, my yeah, swimsuit so with a t shirt. That first <laughs> test shot, I was like, "Oh, oh God!" Sure. He had um, like Heth laughed at mine and said, "I look like a startled fawn." <laughs> Gary Cole said that he, oh, he was looking. He goes, and he just starts laughing because I was terrified. But. A startled Anyway, fun. Larry, not to talk about us. We're um, here to talk about you. <laughs> so so um, there was something that you wrote that really um, it, it landed with Karina and I in, in a big way. And, and I just love the way that you said it. And this is something that we're asking all the guests when they come on is, uh, you know, what what's the impact that have had on your life personally and um, and as well as in, in your career. And you said, I would have my 1 p.m. calls with Hef. And when answering the phone, it was always like stepping up to bat at the World Series. And I was just like, that could not be, I mean, that could have not been said better. Mm-mm. And then the, um, what was, the, where was that other quote that he said about uh, giving the allowance? So, loyal. I love. Oh, the, sorry. The, I love how you loyalty. say loyalty yeah. was a paramount was, yeah. importance. Loyalty was a paramount importance, and that's a given with all of the people that were there for years. Mm-hmm. And so, were, so talk about that. Tell loyalty us. Loyalty is know, a beautiful. Tell virtue. us more about you know working yeah, intimately was, with uh, Hef. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, certainly the the phone calls at one o'clock, uh, and this was back in the early days of cell phones. So I had this large brick. And I'd be at a restaurant, and at any given time, I would That's expect right. they were huge. You know, the, this this call, you know, to come through, and it just go over. You know, he's looking at some artwork because, you know, most days I'd be sending artwork up to the mansion or pitching him on on something. And there's no, I mean, he, you know, very much right to the point. He'd be looking at the artwork. It was always amazing. He would see something in the artwork that the rest of us wouldn't. Sure. And and, and we'd sort of like, you know, smack our heads. It's like, how did we miss that? Mm-hmm. You know, and, and, and his his impression of that. And, and and the job was very much, it's like to listen to what he's saying, and then and then how, how do you go fix it? So typically, so many of my responses were very much like, you have got it, you know, you'll have another version tomorrow mm-hmm. uh, kind of thing is, you know, to try and push perfection. Mm-hmm. And it was really taught me at those early days how to, you know, continue to push myself, my staff. I mean, I, I hired Michael. Michael Lee and, and Michael you know, was fantastic. And Michael would always set such a high standard over anyone totally. that we hired, anyone yeah. that we would work with. And so and for the rest of my career, that really served me so well. And if anything, I've actually, if you think about a pitcher who's got a pretty good fastball, but sometimes uh, it's sort of like I would have to take a little bit off the fastball because I found other teams, other creative teams they could not yeah. hit that they level. Get on board, and it yeah. was almost too much for them mm-hmm. to expect that 
you know, to happen to push them. And if anything, they start to take it wrong or personal. It's, right. it's not personal. It's just about the art, you right. know, and, and getting to that certain, certain level. Standard. It, a little bit it's of a theme in terms of standard. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was just, it was just the standards were off the charts. In fact, in the early days, we had to watch money later, but in the early days there was, you know, I, I had photographed with, with national geographic and was looking at life and look, and there was no other magazine that basically I never looked at budget. I mean, right. if I if I was in Alaska and I needed a helicopter to go on top of a mountain, which I did, then yeah, I just simply spent spent the money. At, at that there point, no in those days, there was spared. no, yeah. you know, it, it was kind spared. of whatever it took to yeah. to make it. Yeah. On loyalty, it was interesting that I always felt, certainly as myself, like, am I an okay photographer? I, I guess so. But the difference there would be if you look at all the people around Hef. I mean, it was it was a team. Mm -hmm. So certainly, if you think about traveling, you know, you've got security, you've got mm -hmm. Mary, you've mm -hmm. got mm -hmm. a host of other people, and it, the presumption is everybody's pretty good. That's why you're there in that role. But, but the other key difference would be the rest of it. Maybe seventy five percent of it. The rest of it was: Do we understand we're here to to make life work? for him. And right. so if, if, uh, if I'm there, there's an interview with the, the national network, they're coming in, I'm going to take photographs. Uh, the way the setup is the chair is a little bit too low versus the, the, you know, the, the talent that's come in from a network, right. I could call, I could call down to Hank, uh, you know, in, in the shop and yeah. say, basically Hank, and I got five minutes. Yeah. I need this chair four and a half inches taller. You got it. And it would be done. Yep. And, and it, it was that kind of uh, we can make this yeah. this happen. And and being uh, able to get along with everybody. I think you said that that's, as well. That's you know? what he it was because this. often there yeah. was pressure. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes. In, in terms pressure. of, you know, uh, it's just, you know, you got this group that's moving at times when we would travel, you know, sort of, you know, high rate of speed. We got a lot of publicity, a lot of things to do and sort of inter, interpersonal skills. And I think the yeah. ability to genuinely like you yeah. know, uh, the other people that were all working together, understanding what we're here to do, Definitely. you know, in consort uh, together. And and that, I think, was really a lot of the key. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly, I think, in terms of in terms of my tenure there and, wow. and the others who and, were with them for so many years. Yes. And, 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 what, and what an, what an, uh, a great and fundamental um, uh, trait to to have as a human being to take that away, because that helps you then in all types of relationships, you know. It mm -hmm. does, but you teamwork. Know? I think of how that's how, huge. I think of how Hef knew who was, was playing right, what yep. position, yep. and he would move yes. <laughs> people to the right position, mm -hmm. but because he saw their worth, and and he knew, okay, that they may be on first base now, but I yeah, I'm seeing them, mm -hmm. I'm seeing mm -hmm. them as a catcher here, uh -huh. exactly. and he would be able to do that. Like it, yep. it, it's it's a beautiful thing to really look back and see, and. Earlier, we were talking about how he wasn't he wasn't an emoter. He was a thinker, like you said. You don't take things personally. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, there's going to be uh, the times where he was disappointed or would sure. lay into sure. somebody, but it was always warranted. It was almost like yeah. the, like, okay. And then it was no, over and done. I, yes, and it's done. Mm -hmm. You don't dwell. Mm -hmm. You don't sulk. You don't, it's, okay, we're moving right along. Yep. And and there's a bigger picture, mm -hmm. and it's you know there's a bigger picture. <laughs> exactly. But uh, well, I'll, I'll share with you something on on that. I mean, you remember again, we have a psychology major here. Oh yes, and, yes, and, yes. And and so, uh, you know, I think the way he would actually work with people uh, when you say the word disappointment, Karina, that was really interesting because. Uh, and a little bit of inside baseball here. I, I had a, a brilliant father, but also a, a very demanding father and, and tried to, you know, sort of meet that standard. And in my own interactions with Hef, uh, there was very much of, uh, I won't quite say this father, son, but it was very much all Hef mm -hmm, had to do to mm -hmm. say on the phone was just say, I don't think it's quite right. I, I think we can get better. This is what I'm seeing. All he had to do was raise an eyebrow. Right. And because of my own life experience, it would be, that was all, I won't say it's traumatic, but it was almost like, that's all you got to say. Yep, and exactly. I'm going to do my best to, to make it. this correct. Clear. With, with others, I'm sure he would have a firmer, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a firmer approach. And I've spoken with people after just getting off the phone with Hef, who I know. Oh, that are ready to cry. Yeah, oh, yeah, oh, they, they, they were crying. And oh. I know oh. what they went through. Yeah. In, in my own particular case, and I appreciated that with him, that he didn't need to ever 
go to go to such extremes. It wasn't it was, a personal you know, thing towards you. It was it was about what the creation well, was. It, it was echo, but it was also interesting. It was personal in this way that he understood that about me uh, to the extent that would be that all was, it takes with Larry is oh, just okay, to yeah, say, yeah, got it. Larry, I I I think. I think right. we can do this. The way and he I think conveyed can it on It's like, I'll yeah. leave it up to you. Like, you know, go make it happen. Yes. It's like, you better believe I'm going to go make this, th- you know, this he, happen he and try knew and, you. Uh, you know, knew, meet that standard. Yes, he knew that about yeah. you. He and, was and very that, good with people yeah. and yes. reading them. I told yes. you how he didn't, he did, had no idea that my grandmother collected dolls, loved dolls, and I'm very close to my grandma. She's in heaven mm-hmm. now. But that said, when he called me a Dresden doll and he had that twinkle in his eye, like, he just wow. knew things yeah. that about each of us, yeah. and he was able to, to pull what was special. Yeah, and like it, he knew that, and you had probably spoken to him, you know, about whatever you did. He doesn't forget. He had a, mm-hmm. he just had that photographic memory mm-hmm. and was a thoughtfulness and knew how you worked, mm-hmm. how mm-hmm. each person worked. That's what I mean about putting them on the right position yeah. on the team. That um, that that voicemail that um, that you shared with me and, and obviously Karina and Pat Lacey have listened to it and the way that he spoke in that was like, um, okay, well, there's just a couple, you know, little tweaks here and and, and if you have some time tomorrow, Larry, you know, please call that me. respect. Yeah, yeah. He demanded well, respect voice, without voice demanding respect. Please do, because we love that. I, yes, yeah, yes, yes, yes. I mean, two stories on voice calls. One of them, there's another one where he, he starts off and it's it sort of goes on for a minute and a half. He's going, Larry, I, I'm thinking, I'm thinking black and, and, and I'll use this kind of, you know, it's, without specifics, like, I think black, you know, I think black, I'm really think, really think black, but I can kind of see sort of maybe the gray, but then, you know, there's a lot to be said sort of for the white and then maybe the white <laughs> and all this. And so, uh, you know, if you'll take care Love of it, it, click. Yeah. And people would listen to that. They'd say to me and say, what was it? What did, what did you do yeah. across that? And I yeah. said, well, I think that was part of it was working with long enough. You would know, I know what he's saying. Yeah. I, I, know, I know what he wants, but one other, one other story on, on phone calls was, uh, I had moved to Oregon sort of the last two years I was with the company and it, he was very supportive. It was great because he mm-hmm. could reach me at any given time. Mm-hmm. And so on a Saturday, uh, I've got the family in the car, uh, sort of my daughter's junior high school and my, my son, who's probably maybe, maybe nine or so. And we're, we're going to, we're in the car, we're ready to go take a trip. And, uh, and then, so my son says, I forgot something. And I'm kind of getting impatient, you know, let's sort of go. And he goes, I'll, I'll be in the house. I'll, I'll be right back yeah. from the garage. He runs in the house. Minutes pass. And, and he comes back and I kind of go, what, what kind of took so long? I thought you were just going to grab a jacket or something. He said, well, I was on the phone. <laughs> Who are you on the phone with? Hef. That's so rad. <laughs> uh, what did he say? What did you talk about? He said, well, he, he wanted to speak to you, you know, if you're available. I said, okay, what did you tell him? I said, Dad can't talk right now. He's in the car. We're going to the mall. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, and, no. That's and, and then at that point, I said, I said, probably respected I said, it. Yes. What, what did Hef say? And yeah. He said, oh, okay. We'll tell him later when he has time. Give me a call back. So I so, love so, it. He so yeah, so it was very, very sweet. So, so and, very and, 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 and the kids basically, you know, when they were growing up, we would go to the mansion and yeah. you can imagine, I mean, a, yeah. a zoo with over 160 yeah. different species there. And so the kids would and the play Easter's with the squirrel there. monkeys yep. and, yep. and yep. It, was, yeah, it was a zoo for the kids. Yep. Yes. They would just Beautiful. have a blast growing up. I, Absolutely I always beautiful. feel like our children are so uh, blessed and fortunate to have I had that experience. I never took my daughter. Uh, great. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, and the game room was pretty was pretty cool. Oh, too. that was so the best. Really, that was yeah. our fave. That was our fave. There, um, I I found out that they're keeping the zoo up on the property there, and it's like one of the only properties I think like in the, I don't know if it's in California in the country that has an actual zoo license. So they've kept all the animals. Yeah, up there. he For, was at, at that time in L.A. Uh, he was the uh, had to have a personal zoo license. Right. There were four full time. Uh, zookeepers, and I, there's a term for that, but there was basically four full-time people who worked across all the different uh, species. Wow. And what they did was they would actually do trading with other zoos. So there would be certain exotic birds, and there was actually a program between the different zoos. So here's half a private zoo. He's working with the St. Louis Zoo. Or oh, the, how cool. You know, we were, I didn't know cities. this. I yeah. Didn't, and, I, and at one point, Steve Curry, uh, so go part of my background, National Geographic, Steve Curry, one of their well-known photographers, Steve was going around the world photographing sort of exotic uh, animals and species and mm-hmm. to some extent, you know, private 
And so Steve came to the mansion, spent the afternoon. We went around and he photographed oh, a lot wow. of these uh, really sort of exotic, yeah. you know, animals that are not very, very common no, and, rare. And, and separate from all the different areas where they were, uh, you know, I'll, I'll say displayed again for la- cages, lack of a better term, but, but basically you know, in the backyard, there would be Ethiopian crown cranes running right, at one exactly. point. There was, you know, emus exactly. or running and, and, through. And, and, and you would never think about section, it. The nocturnal, yeah. if yeah. there was, there's yeah. the room. Yes. And you would never think about it because you're like, oh, it's just the mansion or about the cost it would have for a party or anything. And now it's just yeah. like we get, we're getting so much more information of like, oh my I God, bet I if never we went into it, he probably, so he made oh. a contribution there yeah, to wildlife huge. and to I, I, I rare to animals. You, I'm sure he's made all kinds I, I, of. I, I, you, yeah. you can't take this personally, but I have to tell you one playmate story. Please do. Uh, who, who she would often say things. And she was terrific. I won't mention her name, but she was often would be, you know, she, she would call security and say, we got to tighten up, you know, security. Cause I noticed every time that, you know, every time people drive out, the back gates always open. Mm-hmm. And, and of course that's where the security shack was. And they mm-hmm. would see a car coming, mm-hmm. they were open it. But the, in terms of all the animals and thinking about them everywhere, right? there was one afternoon where we had, had a, it was a holiday, had a big event. There was a volleyball nest, a volleyball court uh, set up in the grass. And then uh, somebody noticed and said, my gosh, look up at the tree. And then something that was about four feet long was a huge uh, bee's nest. It was <gasps> massive and, and growing by the moment. And Whoa. so someone calls, you know, security and the grounds people. It's like, let's all step away from this. You know, let's yeah. be careful. Yeah. And, and <laughs> she looked up at it and just kind of said, well, you know, I don't know who decided to let the bees out today. <laughs> And so the idea that they were oh, also funny. probably somewhere, yeah. also stored somewhere else. Yeah, on, on he probably yeah, had exactly. his own honey. Yeah. No one knew yes, about right? it. <laughs> Hef's honey. Hef's honey. Just keep that in the, my hidden area in the kitchen. Which Karina knew where it was. She'd yes, go get I used those to cookies. sneak into that and ah. his special <laughs> cookies, which I... We still need to get that recipe Where's from that Brian. <laughs> I finally tracked that down. I'm so yeah, happy. Yeah, we do need to contact him for that. Oh, my Thank gosh. For oh, that. I, can I ask him what you I ask, ask him whatever everyone. you want, honey. So if, if we, I, I always address, I always ask this in terms of if you were saying what you wanted to say to Hef at, in memoriam, you mm-hmm. know, or, mm-hmm. or almost like a eulogy or just or the a, last time you saw him and the, knowing yeah, it would something be something that you would, you would have yeah. liked to say to him or or attribute to to him. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you know my great gratitude would be that he allowed me uh you know to share so much time with him. Nice. And if you think about, you know, everything sort of the celebrity and 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 his life, his world. Mm-hmm. And uh, actually, after about a year after I left, there was one of the volumes that came out uh, all about Playboy, a very large volume. And he graciously he sent it to me. And, and on the end flap on the inside, he wrote, you know, thanks, Larry, for jo- for uh, for joining me in the journey. That's you know, awesome. Hef. Wow. Mm-hmm. And so I, I think that uh, on the professional side, you know, really being forced to learn what I would be capable of in terms of, I'll say, creativity you know, and, and professionalism and try and hit a certain high watermark. Uh, in essence, he, he gave me a, a a life in terms of, I mean, I, I photographed most of the Playboy interviews at that time. So oh, I'm did? going to the car races with uh, Paul Newman. I'm having tea in the afternoon with Betty Davis. I'm oh going on gosh. tour with Linda Ronstadt. Wow. I'm with uh, Dudley Moore right. at his, his house and he's playing on his right. grand piano mm-hmm. while I'm sitting there. And so if you think about, you know, sort of all those experiences Mm -hmm. that I was allowed Mm -hmm. uh, to have, uh, and and again, just being next to him and and his confidence in me uh, in terms of, you know, trust. uh, And uh, yeah, I I would just, you know, all of that was really an amazing, you know, I I consider myself, there's this little kid from Shreveport, Louisiana and how I ended up here, Uh, but we'll forever be grateful for all of that. It's wonderful. I love that. Uh, yeah, Bill Farley earlier, we asked her, Karina asked the same question. And he, again, he said kind of like, like, oh, well, and he said, I, I think I just would say thank you. And I was like, that's awesome. That's perfect. It's like, All what else can us. you say? Thanks. You this know? is our thanks. Yeah. Three words that describe Hef. Ah, uh, uh, well, certainly perfection. So I've talked about that, you know, a great deal and, and myself and everyone that was, that was part of the, the journey, sure. you know, uh, around him at that level. Uh, we also, that's another theme we've talked about, you know, sort of was loyalty. Uh, yeah. and, and I know 
there were often times with Mary, uh, you know, there were people who uh, she could smell if, if sort of they had their own agenda, she you know, sure versus could. Hef's agenda. She sure and, could. and that was a big difference, mm-hmm. I think, in terms of and my wonderful relationship with Mary, that she knew always I was going to be looking out mm-hmm. for Hef. Mm-hmm. And that would be, you know, we'd be in a meeting and somebody would look to compromise the quality. And and my role in that meeting was to go, we're not going to do that. Mm-hmm. And I, and actually I was, uh, at, at one point it was interesting, Hef, we're on a Saturday, we're at the mansion and across the floor, we've got all these photographs. We're going over some covers and Hef said to me, he said, Larry, uh, oh, this kind of gets me to think about it. He said, Larry, you have to understand, I want you to have my mantle. You know, I want you to be able to, when you're wow. there in those meetings, you know, you're representing me. That's huge. In, in terms of that, that standard. That's so huge. again, loyalty. I think the other thing would be certainly visionary. And we, we've talked mm-hmm. about, mm-hmm. you know, all the things that people don't recognize. I mean, certainly one creating a men's magazine that became at that time when I was there, second most recognized corporate symbol in the world. Sure. If you think about sort of the impact uh, in terms of, of society, uh, if you think about, uh, again, it could go on and on. I, exactly. you know, the people who, who sort of look at his life and, and look at the things that he was able to do. And I think the other thing would be, you know, you could certainly look at him for those 12 pages of nude in, in a magazine, but I think you have to really look at, you know, sort of, you know, more the rounder, full context, yeah. you know, it's aspects very important in, in terms at, of, yeah. you know, what he, his life. And yeah. uh, so there, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there Thank on, you, on my three words. I know it's, it's a hard one. I, I like ending it with that though. And, and it's pretty, everybody's pretty much along the same line. I mean, loyalty definitely keeps coming up, but I really like visionary. That was a good one as well. Um, uh, gosh, thank you so much for being <laughs> yes. and and um, as I think I, I mentioned to you as well, we are coordinating and we are going to put together a huge celebration of life for Huff. event for Huff. And we'd and love all the family, all to of be the together. Playboy family, to be there and the playmates and the staff and in everybody. his honor, the in way he honor, would yeah, have had a kickoff exactly, party, exactly, just in yep. the way he did it. So we're gonna make that happen. It's very important, and just more and more that we just keep talking to everybody. She well, thanks. <laughs> thanks to you both for reaching out. It's really been a treat to be here with you today. I'm so thrilled that you're able to reconnect with so many names that yeah. that are bringing back such great Larry, memories it's to me. So good awesome. and I, I can't wait to see the. Uh, awesome. Can't wait to follow the series. Oh well, yeah. I, it's so great to see your face. I mean, all of this has been. It's just the reuniting. And and then as soon as I see you, it's like no time has passed. I Even know. though so much time has passed, I can I can picture you. You know, I have these memories that yeah, yeah. Y- you forget and everything keeps until sparked. we're sitting. Yeah. Yeah. So just we are mm. so extremely um, grateful. And thank you to you and to everybody that is is has been willing and coming on and sharing their story of really of paying the, tribute of, yeah, of to the incredible someone that impacted Hugh Hefner all of and our who lives. he was and what he meant to all of us. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank Larry. You. All right, honey. We'll talk soon. Have a great okay. day. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you.